Welcome to The Next Journey, the adventure travel podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White. I'm a prisoner of this It's not critical. I look better than you, lighting wise. You do, yeah. But yeah, darker. I just want to emphasize it's just the lighting that looks better on my side than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. At least we've got some good fun. All right. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the next Journey podcast. My special guest today is Paul Marsh. Many of you will know Paul from the work on the channel, our trips together, and of course, our production, co production, collaboration on the Overland Workshop. Hello, Paul from Cape Town. How are you? Hello, Andrew. Hello, and how is everyone? It's um, lovely to connect with you all the way from Cape Town. And uh, yeah, we've got a, a cool, cloudy day here, much like your weather in Perth, I'd imagine. Actually, you've got a sunny day. We haven't had the rain. Sunny day today in Perth. Yeah. Yes, well, actually, summer's <laughs> arriving tomorrow. It's going to be thirty-four. So it, Perth is typical. Wow. You know, it's it's a bit cold and a bit cold, and suddenly, oh, summer's here. Crikey, it's like a one day. <laughs> Uh, we've just had some very hectic rains for those of you who followed on in the news around Cape Town. And Cape Town does tend to hit the headlines. And I love living here, I must say. It's a beautiful part of the world, and you know it mm. well. But uh, certainly the rains have come through last weekend, 300 millimetres, 50 road closures, and, and really snarled up traffic. So uh, it's, it's why we live in Africa. You know, Africa just has this amazing ability to throw out a curved ball every now and then and, and you deal with it. And it's much like I like to live my life. You make a plan. I was recently yeah, looking at footage okay. and some of the shows that we made together in 2019 when we built the 105 Land Cruiser. And I was sitting at Cape Town International Airport and it was raining, but it was the first rain that you had, that the city had had for such a long time. In fact, you were within one week of, of literally running out of water. It was one of the few large cities in the world to actually be in that situation. And you got rain literally within a week of running out. Oh, and it, no. while I was there and it was just raining and everybody was so happy, but it was just raining and raining and raining <laughs> and miserable. And it was fantastic because everybody, you know, big sigh of relief. You know, Cape Town's an amazing uh, city and, you know, South Africa, as you know, I lived, you know, grew up in South Africa, lived in England, a brief stint in Australia and chose to come back and live in Cape Town having grown up in Johannesburg. And it's such an eclectic mix of cultures here. You know, you've got the Cape Coloreds, you've got the local African, you've got the whites, you've got the international people who mix in. And it's, it's, an, it's a great, I would say, ability for people to really mix and pull together and a lot of fun. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think there's a culture in Cape Town which people really do get out and have some fun. People have a lot to explore. I mean, it's one of the beautiful cities in the world where you can get on the mountain within 10 minutes or of being you know, in and around Cape Town. You can drive out for an hour and be in beautiful mountain passes. You can go and explore the wilderness in a four-wheel drive or a bicycle. So, yeah, you know, for, for me, coming back to Cape Town, which was probably almost 10 years ago, um, was a really good chapter in my life. I'm loving it. Yeah. Cape Town is, uh, of all of the places in South Africa, Cape Town is, you have to go and see Cape Town. It is a wonderfully beautiful yeah, city, yeah, as you say, lots to do. Uh, and um, it's just, uh, Cape Town's special. It definitely is. No question about it. So that's, that's really just a good punt for people to come and explore Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Many before we going to get... Before we get going, I'm going to do a little a little message from our, the sponsors of our podcast, and then we're going to talk about, I think we're going to talk firstly about our Africa Troop Carrier Build. We're going to talk a little bit about that because some stuff has happened very, very recently, and those videos have not yet been released, and, that, and I'm getting so excited. I'm tingling seeing the progress on the car. And the other thing I want to talk to you about is that the other side of Paul Marsh that people don't know about, and that is your experience with long distance um, vintage car rallies that you support on heavily involved in. And I actually want to talk about that and hopefully get some nice anecdotal stories from you. You ready? Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> Let me just thank our sponsors uh, this week. It's uh, Zippo. Did you know that Zippo don't just make those lovely little lighters? They also make inserts 
that allow you to convert a traditional uh, Zapier lighter into a small butane burner. So if you thought the Zippo was pretty good at withstanding a wind for lighting a campfire, lighting a camp stove. I mean, I've always loved the Zippos and that they're, that they're kind of solid and they're slightly cold in the hand and everything is very tactile about them. They're a lovely kind of almost ritualistic way of starting a fire. The butane burners now even in a Cape Town Southeaster, you can still light your campfire. <laughs> so, That's testimony to a great product. So if you look in the, inst uh, in the video description, I will post the Zippo website <clears throat> where you can get some of this kit for yourself. So it's a very, very nice kit. And they also have some nice fire lighters. You know, they make fire lighters, but they make it out of natural uh, pine, which is coated in a kind of a paraffin, like a paraffin wax. Brilliant little fire lighters, really, really good. And they're not, again, they're quite tactile and they're quite nice to use. So thank you to Zippo for, for uh, sponsoring the next journey. Paul, tell me, give me some, what do you think of the color, the new cruiser? Well, you know, the color is something spectacular. And you know, of course, that it's a favorite color of mine. It's got a great history to it. It's, um, yeah, it's my favorite color. What can I say? I think you chose well. Looks stunning, by the way. The number of people, and of course, I've been driving your troopy around, snagging and checking it, and, and the number of heads that turns yeah. and, and people looking at it and going, "Oh my God, that's beautiful!" And it doesn't have the so, bar work um, on yet. It hasn't got the wheels on yet. It hasn't got the wheel arch flare stone guards on it. it. Hasn't got the mud flaps on it. it hasn't got a rear bumper on it, and it's still uh, turning heads. You know, when you when you show people, when I show clients a brand new troopy and then you put it next to one that we've completely built. Because one of our specialized vehicles that I, I build for clients is, is the Troopy. And, uh, you know, you put it next to each other and you can't recognize the vehicle. I mean, once yeah. it's got its roof on and it's got a rack on or a roof tent, as we're doing on yours, or it's got a cut off pop up roof, the bumpers, the wider wheels, it's a different truck completely. And then if you go and paint it to be unique and stand mm. out, it changes it even more. So, yeah, it's, it's coming on nicely. I think. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be very keen to come and see your vehicle, but you have to wait. It's not finished no. yet. <clears throat> Is it going to be a while? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there late April next year and to do a major trip in it. But I, I keep going, actually finding myself actually coming back into my office and like, what was that video Paul sent me? And just kind of look at it and say, yeah, yeah look at it. And I noticed you'd cut the holes for the water orifices, for the water fillers. You did that before the... Um, so we try and do all that. Yeah. Yeah, all the prep work we could do before yeah, it got yeah, painted is really the, important. Inside those water tanks, which I haven't told anybody about those water tanks that actually fit on the inside, but they're actually on the pa inside the panel. So you cut away the panels and you've done all that now. So I've been going through it frame by frame, having a look at my car. It's very exciting. It really is such fun. Yeah, and it, you know, it's, it's nice to see it grow from the ground up. It's like watching a house, you know, you put the foundations down and you build your home. Yeah. <clears throat> what you're seeing is you're seeing a vehicle that we bought that wasn't pretty you know it wasn't rough but it was certainly tired and you see the work the guys did to bring it back to life i mean that vehicle is so beautifully prepared and painted you know you, you said it yourself or you haven't seen the vehicle painted so you know from the photographs and videos it is beautifully mm. done so test me to the guys jason and his team they did a, they did a really good job and i'm looking some of the footage uh, that was was uh, that uh, Steph got from me. They, there's so little corrosion in that car, almost none. And, and you, you, you don't realize how that is a car to buy. I mean, you know, most people would have been put off by the mm -hmm. mileage, five hundred thousand kilometers. I promise you, we were so fortunate in, and we chose. We looked hard, but at the same time, it was a really good buy. You know, it really was the vehicle having lived its life up in Johannesburg corrosion wasn't going to be a big big problem accident may damage maybe and whatever people have abused and that but the integrity of the chassis and the, the actual body of the car was good you know the, the minor accident damage we found was very small mm. and well prepared well mm. repaired should mm. i say so to repaint a car like that and then rebuild all the mechanical stuff that snaymons have done with the axles and the gearbox everything has been redone i mean besides rebuilding the engine um, it has absolutely transformed the vehicle into, you know, you do another serious lifetime with that vehicle. Oh, easily another hundred, uh, half a mil again, easily. 
Well, you know, it's like anything. I think you can get mileage out of cars like this if you look after it. I mean, I, I had some Toyotas in the time I've been in South Africa that have clocked over a million kilometers. Mm. And it's, it, you don't believe it, but it's just people take care of their vehicles and they look after it. And, you know, a million kilometers and you think, wow. You take it to Toyota and they go, well, what's the problem? You kind of expect that if you look after it. Fuck. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great test for me to see that. Good to yeah. see. Very, very exciting. So those videos, for those of you who follow the channel, those videos will be coming out towards the end of October where we're going to finish the solo, our solo trip, my solo trip through through um, um, the outback. Then we're going to do a little bit on the US, Gwen and I's last trip on the US. I think that's two videos, it might be three. And then we're getting back into the South African Troop Carrier Series with our discussion that we had when I was there about the interior. Then a lot of the interior we shot while I was there. I want to, I want to parallel that with... As you're actually building my vehicle, you're going to go, I'm going to cut back to our discussion and kind of to through, you know, then and now, then and now, then and now. And I think, I think that's going to be an exciting yeah, process. Yeah, it's going to be great. And, you know, we've, we've not only, everything we do on the Troopy, we, we enhance the design. So little tweaks have been made. We've now designed a beautiful rear step. Uh, you know, Skulk is a really talented engineer. And so the rear step is really nice. We've had our prototypes and that and the little changes that we upgrade. So the whole idea was, as you, as you know, was to put a system out there that we really have taken 30 years of my experience of building trucks, put in all the ideas together with a brilliant engineer, together with about 12 that we've built feedback from clients. So right now we've got a true P that I think is world-class in what we put out there for an overland mm -hmm. truck to drive globally, mm -hmm. really. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to you driving it. It is going to be the best trooper you've ever owned. We committed to that, so you're just going to come and drive. Oh, you've got to, to be the best <laughs> I've ever owned. You've got somewhere to go because I'm in love with well, my great troop carrier. I must tell you, but <laughs> the interior I think is yours is better. I think I think yours yeah. is better interior. Yeah. But anyway. but anyway. Um, <laughs> For another time, yeah. uh, we'll leave that. We'll so argue when we see each other. We'll argue, and we're going to talk about <laughs> also do 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 a, a short trip together or something. It would be good. Yeah, we'll yeah. definitely. I know. Well, my trucks is color, so we have to do a trip well, together. Well, I think that uh, the channel would love to have a good look at your eighty series. Really, they yeah, would. Yeah. So, yeah. knowing how mechanic, you know, a mechanics vehicle is always the one that breaks down. Because they never work on their own vehicle, they always learn on other people's vehicles, and I think it might be the same with you, because you had your you yeah. had your eighty in Cape Town forever, and you've hardly driven it at all because you're spending all the time building other cars, and then you neglect your own until you did the the the, pay, so the paint job, which was which is beautiful. Yeah, I took my Troopy. So my Troopy was I'm sorry, my eighty series was bought in England. And I prototyped it for many of the, the build work and some of the products we designed in England. And then I brought it, took it to Australia when I moved there. Then I brought it back to South Africa. Then I took it to Southeast Asia on a rally around Southeast Asia for almost a month. Then it brought it back. And then it stood. And we, that's where the point we decided, right, we're going to paint it. We're going to do the whole interior. And then we designed a full-on interior for it with all laser cut, did, designed our own water tanks, everything to really give the, the 80 series a world-class feel. And I basically looked and thought, what did I want? What do I feel I'd want in my truck? And of course, it's you know always subject to opinions and what people really want. But I'm very happy with the outcome. And it's not quite finished yet. It will be finished by the time you and I do our trip. And you're so right. My truck sits on the back burner for most of the time. And Joe nudges me to get work done it because she wants to go and drive yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen to her. She's the one who's going to, yeah, manage the timetable. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely right. So yeah, so that's part of you know my 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 passion, uh, like you. My real passion is actually flying, uh, and you you're much the same. But my my life's work has been around four wheel drives. In my early days, you know, I did engineering, and then I went into my own business in the motor trade, and I trained as a tech as a mechanical technician as well. And um, of course, the early days in South Africa, you know, we worked on cars, which are now classic cars. And um, many of the, the cars that, that we go on in these big rallies um, are classic, some vintage cars, um, uh, some veteran cars, but mostly classic cars. So um, 
it's very interesting, uh, I guess, uh, you know, to share with you the, the, the start of the whole journey for me on the classic car rallies was when I moved to England. I moved to England in 1997. And the idea was then to go across to England to with my former wife, uh, Nikki, to go and get passports. And we had British ancestry. We could go there, live there for a few years. She's a medical doctor. And the two of us decided to head across to the UK and start up a life in the UK, which I thoroughly enjoyed for 18 years. And thereafter moved to Australia and then back to South Africa. And But the reality of the whole um, journey was once I got to the UK, I saw a little advert. No, let's go back a step. Once I'd, I'd got to the UK there, a friend of mine who owns Easy On, Jack Stuller, Jack drove up through Africa. He drove his troopy up through Africa. After elections in 95, everything opened up because we just finished a trip driving through Africa. We spent uh, one and a half years exploring Africa, right up through East Africa, all the way up to Sudan and back down again. And that sort of set this, the stage for us to come across to the UK and carry on with the work we wanted to do. Um, but not the, the, the classic car story really came about when Jack arrived on my doorstep and said to me, Paul, I want to sell my trippy. So we put an ad in the local magazines and that. And, and a guy phoned me up called Terence. And uh, Terence English called me up and he said to me, Paul, I want to buy this car. And he was happy enough. He was told me about a rally. He was going to drive through Africa from London to Cape Town with 80 vehicles, a mix of four by four classic cars and um, all the vintage cars as well. So that's quite a challenge to take 80 vehicles from London to Cape Town. So I got very interested in the whole, whole story. That night I went and Googled this whole rally and I understood that it wasn't just Terence, it was Sir Terence. And uh, so I told him he needed to come up and have a look at the vehicle. He couldn't buy it from, from me over the phone. He needed to come and look at it. So at that time, I was living on a small, on a farm just outside Peterborough. Terence arrived. Of course, I had to ask him what a sir is. And uh, to my ignorance, he explained that he's, he's, he's a very significant heart surgeon in a very, um, uh, how will I say, polite way. And he just, he did the first heart transplant in England. Right. So um, Terence and I became more than just friends. He's like a father to me, very significant man in my life. <clears throat> anyway, the long and the short was he went back to the rally organization and said, you need to get young Paul Marsh to come to the meeting, which was, I think, about three weeks before departure and tell you a bit about Africa. He's just driven the whole route. So I went along, 80 odd uh, people actually more than 80, it's probably 160 if you took the partners, sitting there, and I stood up to talk about Africa and what you to expect and what the roads are like and, and how they were going to destroy some of their beautiful cars on those roads. <laughs> and Terence had opted not to take his Bentley. He had a Rolls and he had, a, he had an old Bentley, and he's decided that he'd rather take the Cruiser. So he got me involved into classic car rallies. That lunchtime, um, the owner of the, the organization, Ron Brown from Hero Rally Organization, came up to me and said, what will it take for you to be on my rally? I said a very nice word to my wife. <laughs> he, uh, he looked at me and he said, okay. And I said, well, there's only one condition. There was a doctor involved and he was from South Africa. He was the chief medical officer. So Mark Human, Dr. Mark Human, he and I met at that lunch. Um, what I didn't realize that he and Nikki, my ex-wife, had trained together in South Africa. So he was the chief medical officer for the rally. So I said, there's only one condition. The two South Africans drive in the vehicle at the back. And we set up different crews on the rally. We had doctor, mechanic uh, in two vehicles and one paramedic and a mechanic. So we had three support vehicles for 80 vehicles. Now, you must think about that. Three support vehicles for 80 vehicles. Eight. The enormity eight, of what 80, can go did you wrong. Say 80. 80. Eight zero. Wow. Okay. No, oh, it's it's daunting. I mean, you know, when you set off and you leave London and you drive across the Channel and you go, well, you took the train and into across across Europe, all the way down, <clears throat> right the way through um, into um, through through into Israel through into Egypt, all the way down. And then we got to Egypt, we used the Russian Antonov. 
big heavy lift aircraft. And that plane was used to fly the vehicles across some of the areas we couldn't drive across very easily. And we flew into Entebbe in Uganda. So again, 80 vehicles on an aircraft. You put 40 and 40, so 40 vehicles on an aircraft. Think about the logistics. And if it didn't make it difficult at that point, when you get into Egypt, they issue you number plates, special number plates onto each car. You get a set of number plates. And when you leave, you have to give them back. It's like a, a way of controlling the cars in and out. And uh, of course, we got the number plates issued to every car. What happened? Half the people wanted to keep them as souvenirs. So now the Russian Antonov has got to be loaded at about 2, 3 in the morning. It's got to take off before sunrise. That's around 4 a.m. So the air is more dense and it can get off with this heavy weight into the skies and fly across to Uganda. Now I've got to go and wake up people, uh, fast asleep, get them to ruffle through their luggage, give me back them the number plates before we can load the vehicles onto the planes. So that rally was probably one of the most interesting, fun. Um, we had a good mix of young and old people. The crew were phenomenal. We worked really hard. You'd often be working late into the night, sometimes through the night, trying to fix cars and sort cars. Your vehicles, the vehicles that we carried, which were fully kitted with medical equipment, stretchers, you can imagine what medical kit the doctors put in. Then the mechanics put their kit in and all the bits and pieces to repair a car. So, you know, coming from South Africa, we've had to fix things all our lives. You know, you didn't just buy a new thing, you had to fix it. And I love as a kid pulling stuff together and fixing it. You know, the stories I used to, what I used to do. In fact, <laughs> besides building model airplanes and pulling my mother's washing machines apart and the lawnmower apart, when I left home, I unpacked a small hobby room that I had. And I said to my dad, I pulled out a little bag, plastic bag, and it had a clock in it. And I gave it to him and I said, you know, I could never put this back together. And he just shook his head and he said, my God, <laughs> there's one thing. I didn't think you'd get that right. But at the same time, you know, that was my life. I used to pull stuff, anything that mechanical I could pull apart and fix it or look at it. And I wanted to know how stuff worked. That stood me in great stead over the years to be on the side of the road with not much at all disposal and making a plan. And that means you cutting up Coke cans, taking wire from fences, um, bits off other cars to make things work. You know, you've got to make a plan to get a car fixed. So I, I, want, just... I want to go a little bit deeper on that in terms of what broke and that kind of thing, but just step back just a little bit. What kind of, what is typical of the car? Are those 80 cars? What year was that? And what typically was the kind of car that people were driving? So the pre-wars, I can't remember all of them, but I mean, you know, they'd be uh, early turn of the century. Pre we had some pre-war and some post-war. I mean, we had a La France Simplex. Wow. And I, I can't tell you the exact date, but it's an old chain-driven vehicle. That, for me, the guys who drove it worked on it. And I had huge respect for them, two Dutch guys. And that vehicle drove, it was an old fire engine to start out. And it drove all the way through on the route through Africa. Incredible. I mean, I was blown away at, at, at that. And... Um, I must say it was it was something truly inspirational to see how people pull together when things go wrong. You know, as much as you've got the mechanical crew, a lot of the people are very hands-on in their own cars. When things go wrong, people all muck in to help. So you get those pre-war cars, you get some post-war, and then your classics. You know, classics traditionally are 30 odd years old. So, you know, you, you the, the, as it grows on, your, your classics, you know, keep changing. But your early classic cars were probably what we grew up with now, you know, 30 odd years ago. So those are the cars, the Mercs and the Porsches and Bentleys and Healy's and Aston Martins. And, you know, they're all cars. They're, some of them are 30, 40 years, 50 years old. And um, beautifully, some of them have been really well restored. And many of them had been properly prepared and some not. And that was the hard part because the rally organizer would put it out to everyone to come and join the rally. Some people had experience, so they knew, knew what to do and how to prepare their cars. You know, now the biggest challenge with these cars is you, you, you're carrying more weight than you should. And that's what generally breaks the cars is the weight. 
The roads, yeah, bad roads. Those cars were designed to go over those bad roads. I mean, the old Bentleys, the early Bentleys, um, they, they're brilliant. They, they're built very strong. They can handle the roads. But the what they can't handle is, is the, the excessive weight that people put in the cars. And so, you know, all the weak points start showing up on cars, bad roads and lots of weight on a car. It's a recipe to really pull a car apart and break it up. And of course, then you add in um, control sections. So they have speed trials and that in different sections. So, you know, you've got a whole different stages, which is quite technical and the guys drive and they've got to follow certain speed speeds to get through these in certain times and certain checkpoints. And, and that adds another dimension, dimension to it. So the whole crew that organizes this rally is not just about the logistics of all the hotels and making sure that happens, which in itself is an enormity. It's closing off roads. It's, it's making sure that when you come into certain cities, you've got people opening roads for you. You've got place to park, park all these cars. You've got security. You've got places to work. And most evenings, you, you work on the cars where you park them. So five-star hotels, wherever you're staying, become mechanical workshops in their basements and parking lots because that's where everyone's fixing their cars. But it's just fascinating to see the camaraderie. And, you know, it's, it's overlanding in a different way. And I think much as though these people would stay in quite nice places every night, the challenge of driving those old cars was really a testimony to the driver, the perseverance, the dedication, and, um, you know, things go wrong in big ways and, and quite often some very big accidents. And, and that's, that's, that's always tragic when that happens. You know, we've had fatalities on rallies. We've, you know, had to deal with that. Um, we've had big accidents where cars are no, no longer drivable. You put them on trucks, you truck them ahead for a few days uh, till you get parts. And then you either fly parts in or you manufacture parts. You fix it. You make a plan. So, um it's, it's, it's actually probably more challenging and more exciting than all the overland travel where you can prepare yourself. You know, you've got a pretty robust 4x4. Four four. It's not really going to break. But you get a classic car and the guys rip the exhaust off or the fuel's a problem. I mean, I had once in the... Uh, we were coming through Laos from... Uh, we, we did another rally from London to Sydney, which was um, an epic trip. I have to say it was probably one of my favorite rallies. So I've rallied across every continent. You know, South America was a big one. We'll talk about that because that was significant. But London to Sydney was a much smaller group. There were about 20 odd vehicles. There were four of us who put the whole rally together. <clears throat> um, I was approached after South America because I wanted to stop these massive big rallies um, after South America. And the guy approached me and said, listen, how about four of us, medical, mechanical, route planning and logistics, and we're going to drive to Sydney. And I said, right, we're up for it. So we set up a company called Global Rally Organization, headed up by a guy called Rick Dyke Price. And Rick is an amazing guy. He was just so good at leading the group, um, very thorough in his preparation. He did all the logistics, the organizing, the hotel bookings. Stuart, he's a very good friend, Stuart did the entire route plan. Now, if I have to tell you, you're taking... 25, 20 odd vehicles from London to Sydney, and you've never driven one kilometer of the route. There isn't another rally organization would do that. Every rally organization pre drives the route, pre checks it out, puts the route books together, and then hosts the rally. Well, we didn't do that. It was for, for one, it was going to be very expensive to pre, pre drive it. We were doing it at cost to everyone involved. And we weren't making profit out of this. This was basically cover costs for the group of friends. So the group of friends were all keen. I changed the format in that rally that every vehicle had to come to my workshop in England. And I scrutinized every vehicle three months before. So I had a very clear idea of what needed to be done to the car or what, had, what was going to break. So from the previous rallies that I'd done through Africa and around South America, I saw so many problems that taught me a lot about what did break, what didn't break, where we could improve things, how we could better things. So when it came to London to Sydney, we made everyone do first aid courses. We made everyone carry certain equipment. The spares, the heavy stuff were put in the four wheel drive. So the cars were kept much lighter. We pre scrutinized every car three months before, so I could then give them a full list of 
modifications, things to strengthen, bits to carry. They had to carry the basic spares in their car, the roadside spares, fuel filters and points and condenser and stuff like that, that if there was a problem, we could fix it quickly. And uh, that put everyone in great preparation. And I remember driving out of Marble Arch from under Marble Arch in London. And I was driving my Discovery at the time that I had and, uh, and thinking, we're going to drive all the way to Sydney. It's a, it's a daunting thought. You know, you're looking and thinking we're going to drive, you know, across out of the UK, across the, t in the tunnel, across into Europe, right through Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, drive across the Karakoram Highway at that time, up through Western China, where there were no roads. They were making roads at the time. So these classic cars, some of them open top Jaguars and that, some of them refusing to put their roofs up because it didn't make much difference. The dust still came in. We're driving across these dirt roads in Western China. And, and at that time, there were no maps with English signs on it. You got a Chinese map with a route drawn on it. So when you got lost, and we did, because we didn't drive in one trail, you kind of, you made your way. And me being at the back, if I stopped for a repair, I would be um, often behind the whole rally and, and, you know, I'd have to rely on my map and finding my way. So we get lost and then you'd have to stop off somewhere and you'd have to go and ask. The older people couldn't speak much English, but the kids were pretty good with a couple of words. But if you showed them the map, they could read it and they'd point you generally in the right direction or the police would find you and the military would find you and they'd put you back on course and off you'd go, you know, and we drove right across China. And, you know, you get, we, we then made our way down south and uh, into Laos. Um, and then some of those routes, we, we hit big landslides. Uh, one night we, we slept on the mountain. There was a landslide and we couldn't get through. So we all slept in the cars. We had no choice. So we carried emergency food and we carried warm sleeping bags because we prepared for this. We knew that this, this may happen and it did. You know, and uh, so, you know, I can I can remember the one we had an E-type Jag. I mean, probably one of the most unsuitable cars, <laughs> but it was a beautiful car. This guy loved his car, Colin. But my God, did we work hard on that car to keep it on the road. And, uh, and the one day, what would happen in the evenings, the cars would all arrive at the hotel. And um, generally I would come in last and then the guy who's got a beer waiting for me would probably be the first person and say, hey, Paul, come, I've got a beer for you. Come and fix my car. I just had to be sure there weren't too many cars to fix so I wouldn't get through all the beers. But uh, that's what happened. I'd, I'd, I'd literally arrive in and I'd start working on the cars. And uh, sometimes I eat my dinner on the bonnet or whatever, you know, and you fix the cars until they're fixed. And, uh, you know, you, you, you make a plan, you pull parts out. And the one Healy we wrote, the gearbox was a problem. So we pulled the gearbox out. We had to put it on a truck, but not a conventional truck where you've got, you know, a nice low loader. No, this is a normal truck. So reverse it up to a heap of sand and a couple of planks and push the car on it and tie it on and off he drives and, um, you know, we'll pick him up further down the road. And at one stage we, we towed, we towed one of the vehicles along the Afghan border for, I don't know, the, the whole night we, we towed him behind my discovery the whole night we just towed him until we got to the next place and then there was a one of the guys flying in and i said you're going to fly in with a gearbox so he literally convinced the airlines to put a gearbox on on his, in his luggage in the plane and bring it to us and other times you know we'd get to a place and the local workshops were great and the local car clubs would help and that's the one thing about classic cars you know when you put it out there you get a lot of help you know in, in, in Iran, the Prime Minister wanted to have tea with us. So we all went and had tea with him. And so, you know, we've got some incredible opportunities to, to, to enjoy. And we see the planning of, of the route was to take in some of the most spectacular scenes, you know, go into China and, and go to Chengdu and go and see the, the, the pandas and, you know, make your way through. So you, you don't drive just a route to see it. So we took out the competitive element completely and it became an adventure drive and that's that's what we changed massively so the adventure drive was now to explore to see to experience to meet the people iran was fascinating talking before, to before we get into iran i want to hear that but just give me a i, I remember once you mentioning that e-type jag and what you had to do that night 
and you had <laughs> i remember this vaguely share that story with us because oh, it right. sounded ridiculous but please share it with us it was crazy so the e-type gave us probably the most headaches on that rally um he the car was quite low at the front and i'd had a an aluminium skid plate in the front and that from all the bumps and everything he had to eventually had to strengthen it up with steel and and he cracked his sump which is a cast alloy sump mm. so now we're in china and i've got a crack in this aluminium sump it's not a case of putting something in to fix it it's take the whole engine out take the bonnet off take the whole engine out take the sump off now this is happening at night find a workshop that's going to stay open and they're going to weld that up for us to put it all back together before the morning you can happens. find somebody to weld aluminium yeah. a cast aluminium yeah. item in the middle of where were uh, you at the time i was a small town somewhere Wh but which it, country it had, a, it which, had some big which country oh i can't tell you it was sort of somewhere on in the western side of china okay okay you know, china well. china's yeah. enough okay yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> but uh you know that was that was one great uh, how would i say event where we had a lot of help i mean i did it wasn't just me i had a great bunch of guys we had a lot of fun doing it we worked really hard to get it fixed we got it sorted it wasn't difficult it was just a case of pull it out and put it back in and make it all work but um one is one that was really interesting we had a lovely mercedes on a trip and he came around the corner and he smashed into the back of a truck and of course now this was a problem because the vehicle was going to go into australia and I don't have to tell you how strict they are to get the vehicles mm -hmm. in, but this was going to compromise possibly getting it into Australia. So we had a couple of rest days in one of those small towns, and I found a workshop where these guys did panel beating. Now, these guys can panel beat, let me tell you. They don't just replace parts, they straighten them. So I went to the guy, and, and of course, in, you, know, you can't speak English, so you either work for an interpreter if he's there, or it's sign language, or you're using Google Translate where you can, if there's a computer around, or you draw stuff and you, you know, you, you can really make things happen. It's great to communicate with mechanics who don't speak English. You all understand the same language. You're fixing a car. It's kind of not obvious. It's quite obvious, but it's great fun. But this particular car, the whole bonnet was smashed up the radiator, the headlights, the fenders. And I looked at the guy and I said, can you fix it? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, no problem. Obviously in Chinese. And I said, then I said, no, but I needed painting. And he looked at me, kind of like frowned. And there's like a long debate, <laughs> long pregnant silence. It's like, is this going to happen? I can't have a straight car not painted. And he looked and he agreed. They worked 24 hours a day for the two and a half days to rebuild the front of that car. Every part was straightened. The chrome on the grills, the little beads were straightened. The headlights they couldn't replace, we put Toyota headlights in. We fitted a radiator out of another car that we made fit. It, it was incredible to see, but the, actually when you closed the bonnet and you looked at it, you wouldn't tell the difference. <laughs> it was these double headlights in the front work. It was incredible. I was such, and I mean, when he gave us the bill, I added on a heap of money just to give him because it was just incredible for what he did. His whole team just worked. I think there were 10 or 12 of them. They didn't stop. They just kept working, taking shifts and working. I mean, that, that you'd never get anywhere in the world, yeah. never. And these guys were just so dedicated to, and proud, how proud they were when they were finished to have done this. And we could get across, you know, and finish and get the car all the way through to Singapore. So we drove all the way to Singapore. And then from Singapore, we spent three days cleaning the cars. We shipped them into Darwin. Now, there's always this big thing, you know, when you take your car into Australia, will they accept it? Won't they accept it? Well, it was, what's this big um, race they have? It's a big horse race. Um, I shouldn't know, Melbourne Cup. So the Melbourne Cup, I think, was about to be run on the day all our containers arrived. And I went to the guys early in the morning and I said, will you clear some cars today? And he said, well, we'll get through maybe one or two. We've got the Melbourne Cup and, of course, we all stop for that. And he said, but, you know, we've allowed a whole week for your car. So, and we had, we'd allowed 10 days there because we knew it could take time. He took the first car out. It was so clean. I mean, you don't want to know how anal I was about. I know you're reasonably well, cars. Paul. I can imagine it. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> we had those cars 
not only pressure washed, we painted underneath. The tires were washed and clean. We didn't even drive them from the cleaning place. We put them on low loaders to the containers. Every, every precaution, everything in the car was washed and cleaned and scrubbed. Two days solid, everyone cleaned their cars. We got every car through before the Melbourne Cup started. <laughs> and that, the guy, he just, one car after the next, he says, I've never seen cars this clean. And then mine came and he said, I'm definitely going to find stuff in your car. And he put a pressure washer through my chassis. And of course, I knew nothing was going to come up. And I said, oh, beers on this. Anyway, it was so nice. So now we had 10 days to go and explore Darwin. And that was fantastic. I mean, you know, there's an, there's an old... What struck me, there was a great team of, of, of old classic car enthusiasts that had commandeered an old hangar. And these guys were guys who'd retired and they'd come there. And I think the wives would chuck them out the house and they could go and play in this aircraft hangar and just fettle and play with their cars. Well, they were a godsend to us because you had an auto electrician there and you had someone else there. And of course, I had all the help at my hands and they just got stuck into our cars and helped us fix things and sort things out. So, you know, to pull off something like that, when it's one of you to look after 20 vehicles, it's a massive responsibility. And one doctor to look after 20 people. And we had our accidents. Um, we didn't have any near fatalities, but we had people getting quite ill. You know, on different rallies, I've had to evacuate people out, get them onto emergency aircraft. You know, you, you come to accidents, people have died, you're pulling them out cars, cutting cars open. It's... There's, you know, a lot of training I did beforehand to actually be competent enough. And especially if you're with doc doctors, every rally I normally team up with a doctor. And um, so when, it, when Nikki and I parted, we continued, uh, continued doing rallies and, you know, different doctors joined me in the rally. And generally you learn a lot. I mean, you know, you, you had mechanical and medical, you know, one's fixing the people, one's fixing the cars. It's kind of amusing at borders especially in Africa, and you go, no, no, this one fixes the cars and this one fixes the people. You know, it's, but the reality was we really have explored and taken, given people a gift of experiences they wouldn't normally get. I mean, how many people who can really afford to have anything they want have these beautiful classic cars are in a workshop sharing their lunch with the mechanics, loving it. And, and, and the best thing is some of these people are quite significant people in the world mm -hmm. who, who are, you know, leaders and, and what they do and, you know, not a name drop, but the reality is they've come on rallies with us and they can just be normal. Be themselves. And just mm -hmm. enjoy an experience. Mm -hmm. We drive, we're all driving a car along a road and we're all going to enjoy it. And when someone breaks down, you know, you go back and you help and, you know, a car catches fire, you get there, you sort it out, you put it out, you fix it. And, you know, someone on the, on the side of the roads had an accident, not even us, you stop, you help. But of course there was it's, that it's the really, rally that where you actually were the patient. Was that, that's in yeah, South America, so, wasn't it? So, yeah. So South America was another big rally. It was before I did London to Cape Town. Now South America was a rally to drive from Rio to Lima, Lima to Terra de Fuego and back up to Rio over three, like a three month period, uh, but a hundred vehicles. Huh? I kid you not. hundred? A hundred wow. cars, yeah. So you had 50, 54 drives and 50 classic cars. Okay. And again, we, you know, this was one of the events organized by the Historical Endurance Rally Organization. Great organization, great guys, but we had massive challenges. I mean, before we even got there, we had problems with hotels. One country, the agent had run off with all the deposits for the hotels. <laughs> So what we thought were hotels booked, we suddenly didn't have hotels. Can you imagine? For a hundred, for <laughs> what? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I don't want to tell you where people had to sleep and what we made a plan, but that was that was hotel logistics. Um, that rally was probably the toughest I've ever done. Um, it became very dangerous because the crew were very stretched. Um, people got lost. We were going, you know, sometimes you come in after a full day of driving at eight, nine at night, someone's not made it in you have to get back in your car and go and drive again i mean a couple of nights i remember i just took someone who was fresh i said give me someone who's not tired to come and drive with me and i'd go back out looking for people who were lost so you desperately we were desperately desperately pushed beyond our reserves there were times when we didn't get much sleep at night fixing cars and 
finding people and sorting issues out. And we had some major accidents on the rally, but our, my accident was probably one of the worst accidents that happened on the rally. And it was four days from the end of the rally. And I had, Mark and I were pushing to keep up with the rally. And what had happened is we'd had a number of nights where we just had really late, I mean, really, I mean, one, one beautiful hotel, we spent an hour, we came in very late. We had an hour of sleep. We had to get up to drive again. It was crazy, you know? So, so our bodies were that exhausted. And, and this is where, why I'm so vehement about safety and the rules I've put in place from that experience. But long and short was we were in Uruguay. The rally was ahead of us. We were the final sweep vehicle. And I was trying to make up time on one of the dirt roads, quite remote and pushing and driving way too fast, especially for the state my body was in, way too tired. And I lost control of the vehicle. It was a double cab, Mitsubishi, left-hand drive. And I had the car all over the road and eventually I hit an embankment and I flipped the car, flipped it head over and I rolled it six times. Now, with a car, when that happens, the, it doesn't have a roll cage in. So the A post where the windscreen is, that cut me from pretty much above my right eye, right to the back of my scalp. Um, it broke my neck, C5 and 6 were shattered and my spine was a 90 degree bend. Now the car is lying on its side. That morning, the doctor, Mark, took our sat phone, which normally used to hang. We made a hook and hung it next to his, his right ear. We put it in the glove box. And if it wasn't for that, putting it in the glove box, the sat phone would probably have been destroyed. And we wouldn't have been able to call for help and I wouldn't have survived. So the fact we put the sat phone in, Mark's airbag went off, mine didn't. Uh, he wasn't injured. He could get out the vehicle. He could have pulled me out of the window, knowing I had a neck injury. As an orthopedic surgeon, knowing exactly what to do. Your body's amazing. When it breaks something, every muscle in my neck went into a solid spasm. And he literally pulled me out of the car, still bleeding. And I think after four drips to try and stabilize me, managed to call for help. Now, there isn't just a helicopter available. But the doctor, the other doctor in the rally, happened to be with a veterinary surgeon in a town a good while away. And that vet happened to know a very big connection in the military. And they brought a military helicopter in, picked me up. So this Huey flew in, picked me up and Mark up, took me to a hospital in Montevideo where they scanned me and all that. And, and that Sunday morning, by chance, a plastic surgeon had came in to see one of his patients. And he was roped in to stitch me up. So my scarring is very minimal. So the plastic surgeon stitched me up and 20 minutes away was a, probably one of the best well, a hospital where the best neck surgeon in South America operated. And Mark being a orthopedic surgeon scrubbed in to watch them do the operation. Now at that time when they do an operation of what had happened to me, they would come in, take bone from your hip, which actually is more sore than anything. They put plates in your neck and they'd either operate from the front or the back and do one or other. The surgeon did the one, I think it was the front first, flipped me over and then did the back. He was making very sure. He was so gifted in what he did and Mark was blown away, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon watching this man do this operation. And I remember him saying before he left to say that actually, you know, you had an amazing operation. And then Nikki flew into South America and, you know, and it was a road to recovery. And of course, you know, I was one and a half years from my waist down numb. I had to learn to write again. I'd smashed my hand up, you know, neck, but I had a very good physio. I had really good care and I had a mental approach to my recovery where I threw all the painkillers away on the second or third day. Cause once I got back to the UK, I checked myself out of the hospital and I decided I'd go home and work with a physio who was specialized in necks. And that was something I never regret. I worked with the pain and it allowed me to recover much quicker. And my mind was focused. I would never have a negative thought about it ever. And I would get full recovery to everything I used to do. And I did. So, yeah, um, you know, that taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about safety, preparation, where things go wrong and how they go wrong. And I've applied that in my trainings with clients, 
in how I approach my rallies and expeditions. But, you know, we've continued that because, you know, we've, we've driven around the Mediterranean, we've driven top to bottom of South America, we've driven across America, we've driven across Australia, top to bottom of Australia, um, I've driven from Ireland to Russia. So, you know, not all in rally cars, some of them were big expeditions, but on the classic car rally stuff, we then continued with another organization when Global Rally decided they were going to stop their organization. And I joined um, Destination Rally, a Belgian company. And Joe and I, my, my wife now, and her and I actually put together with Destination Rally a support. We supported their support crew and in running rallies with them. So yeah, every year I do at least one. Next year I'm doing three, going through New Zealand. New Zealand's going to be amazing. Actually, I have never been to New Zealand, so I'm really looking forward to that. And we drive around New Zealand. And then after New Zealand, we're doing Africa. And Africa's really exciting for me because we've had such great response. I think we've got 25 vehicles booked for Africa. And that's a great number. And we'll be starting in Cape Town, up through Namibia, across the top of uh, Botswana, into Zimbabwe, round through Manapul, well, not into Manapul, but onto Lake Kariba, down through into Mozambique and making our way back down to Cape Town. So that is five weeks long, five, almost six weeks. So it's going to be great because I can actually show people. I How do I get invited? My... <laughs> a nice word to Bruno. <laughs> I'll make a nice couple of movies. Yeah, I know. I know. That's exactly. Don't don't know. That's true. No, I've I have spoken to him in the past. It's I guess yeah, something to talk about. But so that's we're doing that, and then we're doing India um, later in the year. And earlier this year, we did Sri Lanka in that's January. Right. Sri Lanka was amazing. Ah, oh, wow! What a beautiful, soulful country. Mm. In fact, on our essence of overlanding, we put a couple of films on on that on on. on on Sri Lanka and the, every time we do a rally, we do a little film, but Sri Lanka, the people were just amazing, really just lovely. So, you know, I think the balance of being able to do classic car rallies along with my own overland expeditions with some of the serious professional expeditions we've done along with Joe and I traveling to go and explore. It's yeah. Why not? It's a great life. It's hard work, but I enjoy it. Uh, it's a, it the, the rallying appeals to me, and I think it, it's your opportunity. I finance my trips through the content I make. You finance your trips through you, the support you give to rallies. But the end result is we just get to see amazing, meet amazing people, and yeah. see amazing places, and it's it's fantastic. I, I'm I'm seriously would want to want to be on one of your rallies. I don't know what I would drive or how or where. I, I'm very, very interested. Maybe, maybe my Range Rover. I don't know. I'm just thinking exactly your Range Rover. <laughs> I mean, hey, why not? It runs beautifully. It's it's been for sale for a while now, and it's still for sale. But I haven't sold it, and and uh, it runs really yeah, well. I, just, I mean, it's you know, yeah, so yeah. And no, I listen. There'd be nothing. You know, it's. It's always interesting at the start of any rallies. Uh, rally now, now when we do these rallies, I don't get to scrutinize the cars anymore because logistically it's not so easy. So I've got a whole set of notes I've written up, and it really is the responsibility of the, the owners and the mechanics to prepare their cars. And to be said, most people do a great job and they prepare their cars really well. But some people don't have that experience, or the workshops don't have the experience. And then you know, then my work's cut out for me because you get a car on the rally and you go, "Whoa, this is going to be hard work." And sometimes you get a car and you'll look at the cars, the lineup, and you'll think, I wonder which one's going to give me the most trouble. Yeah. And often it's the unexpected one that's going to give you all the trouble. You know, it's, um, we had two motorbikes on the last rally and um, it was a great couple. They were just lovely Dutch couple and they wanted to drive their motorbikes, their BMWs, and they'd had them completely restored. So, But the lady's motorbike, the cylinder head had a problem. The one valve dropped and there was a problem didn't break a piston in that, but it had a problem. It couldn't run. So I phoned the guys in, back in Holland and I said to him, I said, I need a cylinder. And he said, there isn't one. I said, no, no, there is. You've got one in your workshop. Just strip it off. And he was horrified. I said, no, no, you're going to strip it off that bike there in your workshop. You're going to send it to me. And I think we had two flights. I couldn't I want to tell you what it cost to get me the cylinder head. 
But two days later, I bolted a cylinder head onto her bike and she carried on riding. <laughs> and you know, it's, we had another one. We had an, an old Ferrari that was completely rebuilt, real Ferrari. <clears throat> and um, I think we're driving across America at the time. And the water pump gave in. And uh, the lady and her husband um, got the car to a hotel and uh, pulled the water pump out. And I phoned the guys back to, I think it was in England, they they'd re rebuilt this car. And he said, there isn't another water pump in the world. I said, no, there has to be. I can't, you know. I said, have you got an engine in your workshop? He said, yeah, but I can't take it off. I said, no, no, you are going to take it off. <laughs> You've just rebuilt this car for these clients and I'm in the middle of nowhere. So he did, and you know, which was really nice. But I've had people, you know, when we're traveling, who in classic car clubs get to hear about us going through. And we have problems, we need parts. They will go and bolt the part off their car and give it to us for to get us keep us going, and then down the line we send them back the part. I mean that's the, that's the 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 camaraderie yeah. and the support. Yeah. Someone takes his car sitting in a thing says, "Here, I'm going to take the part of my car, use it." You know, so it's been it's it's just I love it. I mean, what I really enjoy is when I put my car together. So we're now building. I've got a left-hand drive Land Cruiser which I um, was on a number of our rallies, beautiful old 97 car I bought for a very dear friend of mine who's passed on and he gave it to us. And this truck's got 111,000 kilometers on oh, petrol 4.5. It's not even run in. And drive. It's not even run in. It's beautiful. Um, so this is the car we're using on our Africa rally. Okay. And um, I'm having so much fun now putting everything together for the trip, you know, and, you know, it's like anything, you can always make a plan. I mean, I remember being in in uh, Egypt when we were coming down through Africa. We had a Dutch couple and the father was in his 70s and the daughter was, I think, 25 or so. It was a lovely combination. Often you get a father, daughter or father, son or mm -hmm. father, uh, you know, and the, the, the families come together. But the father, daughter combination is lovely on the rallies. Anyway, this whole Land Rover 90 had really not been prepared properly. And we're in her guard. I come across this Land Rover. It's late at night. I stop the front wheel sitting at, a, at an angle. So clearly something's wrong there. I take the wheel off to see that the hub and disc are held on by the, by the caliper. <laughs> and the whole bearing is collapsed. Yeah. There's not, this is not going to yeah. work. I then need to get the, a tow truck. The Egyptians don't speak English, so we're on the sat phone to a hotel to get someone to speak English to tell the policeman I need a tow truck. Eventually, this truck arrives, but it's a flatbed truck. Now, we're talking 10, 11 at night. This flatbed truck arrives, and I look at this policeman, and I go, and how the hell are we supposed to get this Land Rover on this truck? And you can see by what I'm saying that I'm frustrated in that, but he also, he didn't tell me. The biggest front-end loader came around the corner with a bucket probably the size of the Land Rover, raised it above the Land Rover. We put two Hessian ropes, Hessian ropes, left and right hand side. Yeah. We lifted the thing up, and I'm, I'm just praying it doesn't fall, put it on the back of a truck with an axle stand, strapped it down, put a policeman in there, another one, sent it off two days ahead of where we were going to be, and we continued to the hotel. And I woke him up and I said, look, um, your, your car is on a truck. If you're lucky, we'll see it at the next uh, hotel we get to. If you're unlucky, it's been pulled apart for pieces. <laughs> but let's hope you're lucky. <laughs> so same. So we get, I get to the next hotel and anyhow, they've done the same thing. They've taken it off the truck. They make a plan. It's great. That's what I love about Africa as well. And, you know, traveling through the Middle East as well. The guys were very innovative. But there's this Land Rover with one axle stand, the wheel thrown on the roof and a whole sorry looking mess around the axle there. So I strip out the drive shaft, the stub axles all worn away, bearings are destroyed. I find a guy in a container who's got a weld and a lathe. And I sit with the stub axle and I weld the stub axle. I take the CV joint, I pull the shaft out, I push the CV joint into the stub axle and I weld it to the stub axle to give it some strength because it's so worn away. And I build the stub axle up. We put it in the lathe, we machine that down we make a Teflon plug, we plug the hole in the, in the axle so that that's now blocked up, the oil can't come in. I put a new set of bearings on and the brakes and all that. And I said to him, well, you kind of got 
three and a half wheel drive. You haven't got four wheel drive, but three and a half wheels, but you're not going to be able to use four wheel drive, but it'll drive. And then we put it on the Antonov and got into Uganda where I managed to source parts. But it was phenomenal. This guy was amazing. And we spent, we had, we spent an afternoon, I think it was seven or eight hours building up and fixing this whole thing and turn, we had to make nuts because they were buggered and we didn't have spares. And it was just a great way to guys who are so capable with the machine and they'll make it for you. And why not? Just need some time and good craftsmanship. Fantastic. So it's that which really has given me a lot of fun, um, a lot of stress at times. You can't go on these trips and worry about what's going to happen. Otherwise, you'll never you'll never do them. It's like, a, you know, the doctor can't worry about who's going to be a patient. You've got to go on these trips and say, if it happens, it happens. And we deal it with reminds, it. It reminds it me of my crossing with the Range Rover, buying it in Melbourne, doing a bit of work on it and driving it right across, unsupported across Australia. And I put... I put a fridge in the back. I've got a, I bought a rudimentary sleeping bag. Um, I got some food, put it in the fridge. And I thought, well, the, what's the worst can happen? I sleep in the back, on the back seat. That's the worst that can happen. And as it was, yeah. I was driving quite slowly. I was being careful with the vehicle. I was nursing it. I was not doing more than about 90 Ks an hour because I wanted to keep it going and make sure that, you know, and I was checking it frequently. And because of, it was right in the middle of COVID, there was no accommodation anywhere. And so I hit nightfall. And that's when I phoned you. I would pulled off the road. I'd driven half a kilometer through the bush, set up, opened the back of the, of the tailgate, made myself something to eat, and then phoned you and said, I'm halfway across Australia. I've been driving for four days and have found myself in a situation that I have prepared for. While the Range Rover is running well, organising accommodation for tonight has been impossible. I didn't want to do this at night. So I can see a few trees over there. I have no choice but to set up camp somewhere in the bush. I have no tent, very little camping equipment, but sufficient to keep me dry and fed. Welcome to the last chapter in the purchase, collection, preparation and drive across Australia of my 45-year-old Range Rover. Reasonably level. I'll make myself something to eat. I don't have a chair, table or anything like that. I'm going to point the car. Paul. Andrew, how are you, man? I was just saying to myself, I wonder if he's home yet, has he made it? <laughs> okay, now I'm just letting you, you are on camera at the moment. Um, <laughs> I've got the phone on speaker. I am about 60 kilometers from a town called Cocklebiddy on the Air, uh, Air Freeway. Don't know the proper pronunciation, but basically just come out of the Nullarbor I've pulled over at the side of the road because I cannot get accommodation anywhere because there are so many travellers on the road, so I'm going to sleep on the back seat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing how many people independently are travelling. I mean, I see so many in Africa now who've come out to travel. Some can, some can't, and people are just getting in their vehicles and going. Yeah, but yeah. I've had more calls for troopies this week than you'd want to know, I think. It's incredible. Wow. <laughs> so you're sleeping on the back seat. We didn't actually plan to give you, uh, to put in your sort of tent and stuff. I really didn't think you'd have a problem. So I put this kit in because I was concerned that I might have a breakdown and have to be forced to sleep in the car because of one thing or another. <laughs> and uh, it's paid off and the car's running beautifully. I have had, really? no, no, yeah. No no, no, cool as a cucumber. I've got a little bit of a leak from my front right hub oil seal. It's getting onto the brakes, but only a little bit. Um, apart from that, she's running absolutely smoothly. Um, but couldn't be better. So uh, I'm and, very, and very what's pleased. Your mileage? How much? How much mileage? Been so far? so uh, at the moment, I've done approximately two thousand. 600 so far. Gee, that's amazing. Well done. Well, that's, that's, you know what? 
I just I just love the fact that it's it's really looking after you. This is such a lovely experience for you because you've you've owned one of these before. You know what it's like. Yeah. What's the feeling like driving it? You know the funny thing is that it's like it's quite it's like a, a reality check. I remember so clearly when I getting in my Range Rover after you've driven it for about an hour the motor suddenly quietens down and it speeds up and and it's just smooth and fantastic and it's happened exactly you know what has happened um what happened with my old one has happened with this one it feels the same the seats are extremely comfortable they're far more comfortable than my standard troopy seats um <laughs> they're really good seats uh it's a bit slow i'm sitting between uh, 90 and 100 k's an hour because the the engine and gearbox is pretty loud uh, particularly the engine actually uh, the exhaust pipe is is not doing its job like it should so it's quite noisy uh consumption i'm getting consumption of um uh, 15 l liters between 14 and 15 and a half liters per 100 k's which is not terrible for a rover v8 you know, you're still running the engine in. Don't forget that. That is true. That is true. I mean, you haven't even... I don't think that engine did a 1,000 Ks before you took... It. Oh, so it did less than 100. This is brilliant. It did less than 100. But I had just had those contingencies. I thought, if the worst happens, well, I'm, I'm not, I've got water. I've got food. I can, I've got some shelter, you know. And uh, it was actually quite fun, even though when it did happen, I have to sleep curled up in the back seat of the Range Rover. It was fun. Isn't it was, it was just fun, you know. It's great, you know. When you when these con when these things happen, you know, you break down in the middle of nowhere and you've got to do something and sort it out. It's part of the experience. I mean, so many of our clients have come back and basically had an experience where something went wrong. You know, on my first trip through Africa, my very first one, when I took an old Hilux that I rebuilt. When I cracked the chassis in half, I broke springs. I mean, you just didn't have anything like you've got now. This is 30, more than 30 years ago, going up through Africa. There weren't sat phones and GPSs mm -hmm. and all that. You couldn't get any information. You used a Michelin map and, you know, your compass, and you kind of spoke to people. And when things went wrong, people would help you and people would tow you and you'd pull parts of all cars and fix it. And you couldn't get the beautiful suspensions we have or I couldn't afford it at the time. But like you say, it's what's the worst? The worst is that, you know, are you prepared enough to rough it for a night or two? And that's what I believe is important. It's not about, it's about taking responsibility to go and travel fearlessly free to be you if you want and really mm -hmm. explore knowing that you've got some contingencies. You maybe have a sat phone, you've got some food. Mm -hmm. You're not going to die as long as you're careful and safe. And if something goes wrong with the car, you will get help. It just may take some time. That's okay. Part the fun. And then you get help in a way you didn't expect. Make some new friends and come back and go, my life's richer for the whole experience. Yeah. So I've been very blessed in my life with all I've done. And I give gratitude to all the people who've given me those huge experiences and opportunities. And uh, yeah, as long as I can do it, I continue. It's great fun. <laughs> Fantastic. So wonderful. It's a wonderful thing you've done with these rallies. Um, Paul, I, I thank you for your time today. Uh, it's been been really fun. Thank you for your your insights and uh, your wonderful wonderful stories. Thanks, Andrew, and I appreciate being able to share them. It's passion and uh, beautiful stories and lovely people. And thank you for the opportunity. Look after yourself. You, we'll you chat too, soon. everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, keep an eye out on the YouTube channel. Uh, within two or three weeks of this going live, there will be more broadcasts from Paul in South Africa as he carefully, carefully builds my <laughs> my my Land Cruiser. Uh, see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Next Adventure podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White. To find out more information, check out thenextjourney.net. Join us each Sunday. Here.